In the spring of 2019, I began my most expensive project to date. Totaling over $500, I prepared a CAD model, ordered and soldered all the electronics, and spent a lot of time trying to figure out where to use a lathe, and out came Blastwave, a one-pound combat robot with a synthwave-inspired aesthetic. I took the bot to Killabots 43, where it lost its only two fights, one in a quick blowout and another in a close, drawn-out match. This was a relatively poor performance for the bot, and it would have been quite the downer, but I learned a lot and quickly started brainstorming the sequel. Today I'll be going over the major flaws of the original Blast Wave and expanding on how I'm addressing them in this new revision. I'm Caden from Kepler Electronics, and without further ado, here's the CAD model. You'll notice that the whole design is much, much smaller than the original, and that was very intentional. From the beginning, I wanted to make this design as small as possible, as the original Blast Wave had a significant amount of dead space, which ended up being taken over by wires. That's actually another upgrade. Instead of using JST connectors for all the connections as I did in the original, this will be made using directly soldered connectors. This will help reduce weight and also reduce the volume they take up. Also, before anyone asks, yes, the chassis is still primarily PLA, but I wanted to see just how far I can push a primarily PLA full combat ant weight. However, the plastic is being backed up with a pair of 1mm titanium plates on top and bottom. This should help add rigidity and be more resilient than the PLA lids of the original. This robot is essentially what the original Blast Wave should have been if it had gone to the gym more regularly. Less bloat, more power, but the same basic bones. And, in keeping with the same bones idea, we are using essentially the same drivetrain setup as the original. Four N20 gear motors, each directly driving a wheel. The motors for this version are no longer the cheap eBay variety though, but are instead some nicer motors from Pololu. As I can count on not receiving broken or mismatched motors from them. According to some other teams, they may also have better magnets within the motors, so in theory I should have more drive power. I also got rid of the support brackets used in the original Blast Wave, as I found it impossible to remove all the support material. Some of the left behind support material ended up actually ruining a couple motors by jamming the gears with some stray filament. It should be fine to simply face mount the motors, but I may add a super small indentation to better mount the motor if this proves to be a mistake, but I'll save that for later once I've tested things a bit more. The wheels are mounted to the motors with the thin Fingertech twist hubs. The snap hubs they used on the original Blast Wave are being discontinued, so I figured I'd upgrade to the newest model. They are cross compatible, so if I ever need spares I can still use the previous version. The wheels Blast Wave 2 are sporting are the 1.75 inch ones, allowing for a significantly smaller stature. As was the original plan last time, before a short somewhere blew it up, I'm planning on using an NBOTS DESC with integrated Lemon RX receiver. These have the power and the space efficiency to be perfect for a compact build like this. To comply with safety regulations, we also have to have a master power switch and a power LED. The switch is again the Fingertech power switch, this time held in by screws rather than a poorly designed peg system that ended up breaking and being replaced by hot glue. The power LED goes into a hole right here, rather than glued to the front like the original. The weapon motor, while comparatively monochromatic compared to the rest of the build, is the same multi-star viking motor as last time, except that it is mounted on the opposite side of the chassis. With the original Blast Wave, I had to reverse the polarity of the motor leads and run the bot upside down because I'd ordered the wrong thread direction. And, when spinning up, the pulley would simply unscrew itself. Mounting the motor on the opposite side of the chassis fixes this issue. Another issue with the motor on the original was its mounting. It was mounted using a simple 3D printed piece, which would end up melting and bending, and was much too flimsy. To remedy this, the motor is mounted to the chassis using an aluminum cylinder, acting as both a heatsink and a spacer. This will help keep the motor firmly mounted to the chassis, and spaced properly so as to keep the belt in the right place. The weapon bar is bigger than last time, being made from 3 quarters inch aluminum stock, coming in at 80 grams, which is about the same weight as last time. But due to the smaller nature of the bot as a whole, we are able to have the drum reach much closer to the ground. Perhaps the biggest upgrade in the weapon department is that we are actually going to be using bearings this time. That's not to say I didn't plan on using them for Blastoy version 1, but obviously plans changed. I was unable to get 5mm steel shafts for the weapon axle, and was forced to order new 3 16 inch bearings, which were obviously meant for high load applications, as there was more friction when using these bearings compared to using no bearings. Couple that with the fact that in my haste to prepare for kilobots, I misread the dimensions and screwed up the fit, and I decided that the best option would be to use no bearings at all. Obviously that was a bad idea, but it still functioned. This time I decided to flip the bearing mounts, mounting them on the outside of the weapon, held in place by a long screw. I'll have to be very careful not to over tighten this, as that could put extra pressure on the drum. This method of mounting allows for easier mounting of the bearings, and cuts weight from the weapon mounts, as it uses less material than the original design. 
The screws used as impactors are also arranged in a semi-asymmetric pattern, which allows you to have easy balancing of the weapon, but also allows for extra bite when compared to the double-sided system like the one used last time. From what I've gathered, this is because there's less chance of the opposing robot running into the ends of the impactors, but will rather be hit by the impactors as they swing around. The impactors also sit just off the ground, so they can hopefully get under everything but a perfect wedge. And that's Blastwave. According to my spreadsheet, it's about 50 grams underweight, and that feels like a good amount of weight to play with in the final revision. Wires take up weight, and I haven't felt like modeling them, so it'll stay like this for right now. I might also play a bit with the dimension, perhaps adding a bit more space for internal components and the like. Currently, there are two revisions of the cat, the original, which is the version you've been seeing throughout this video, and the second revision, which is slightly longer to allow for larger wheels and a bit more ground clearance. I haven't quite decided which version I'm going to use yet, so I'm just going to order enough wheels to fit both, as the only other difference is the chassis itself, and I can print as many of those as I want. Overall, I'm really happy with how this bot seems to be turning out, and I'm looking forward to the build process. If you want to see more of the build process, be sure to subscribe, and in the meantime, you should check out the build for the first blast wave, along with the videos from Killabots where you can see it in action. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to come again, and keep designing!